Hello and welcome. Um, we are here for an episode of the Color of Change Tell Black Stories series live with one of our and one of my favorite storytellers, <laughs> director, producer, powerhouse, Carrie Washington. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you for having me, Rashad. It's so good to see you. Well, it's so good to see you as well. And for our viewers who are joining us and maybe haven't joined us for other um, Facebook, YouTube um, uh, conversations and or haven't seen the uh, Tell Black Stories um, podcast or live, actually, Tell Black Stories actually recently was just nominated for some Webby um, Awards. Wow, congrats. Uh, yeah, we're really excited. But um, Tell Black Stories is an extension of the Color of Change Hollywood work to ensure authentic, empathetic, and human portrayal of Black people across the media landscape. We bring together storytellers, change makers, and celebrities to talk about the issues that impact Black communities the most. And we dive into everything from what is it like to be a black writer in an all white writer's room to issues that deserve center stage this year. From protecting black people during this pandemic to voting rights, criminal justice reform, and so much more. Um, so if you're interested in visiting us um, and learning more about Tell Black Stories, you can join um, the conversation and our work by going to changehollywood.org or by texting the word storytellers to 225568, that's the word storytellers, to 225568. And so Carrie, I wanna jump right in. So people joined us because they know that we are <laughs> gonna talk about the incredible uh, piece of content um, series that you um, um, produced and starred in, Little Fires Everywhere, which is on Hulu right now. Um, and for folks who are watching and um, maybe um, haven't gotten through the entire series, we are yeah. not going to give the final <laughs> away. We're not I doing that. We're not. We're no gonna, spoilers. To, to no spoilers, but there might be little things here and there that we talk about, but we're not going to give you like the main thing that you want to know if you mm -hmm. haven't gotten to it. So I won't be responsible for that. <laughs> Harry won't be responsible for that. Uh, but if there's like other details, you know, just kind of bear with us um, yeah. as we sort of have this conversation. But I I want to just start off first. I mean, we are we are over video. We are in a in a pandemic. We are um, in a crisis. I just want to know how are you. How's your family? How's everything mm -hmm. going? Thank you for asking. Um, we're we're okay. I mean, you know, I think like a lot of families, we are navigating, especially because I'm from New York, born and raised. So you know, I've had family members in the hospital, and um, but everyone who's been in the hospital is now home in my family. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. Um, and, uh, I think everybody's adjusting to the new normal, you know, homeschooling as a mom, that is, it's a whole different world. <laughs> and, um, I think, you know, life just, I think one of the things that, that the, that COVID-19 has done is that it has really sort of illuminated our places where we need to be doing better, both institutionally and personally. Um, I think about the ways in which we we faced with this virus. We we have to confront the inequities in our culture, whether it comes to healthcare or access to Wi-Fi or um, you know childcare, but also even just with our own friends and family, like. Are we connected and in touch with the people that we care about most? Are we present for our children? Are we um, treating the people who do the work that keeps us alive and safe? Are we treating them with dignity, both personally and institutionally? So I just think it's a really intense time for reflection and all of us thinking about how we can do better and then trying to do better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were, there were so many themes around um, inequality around um, um, who has access to what, who has, what type of choices we have. There was that brilliant yeah. scene around choices, right? And, you know, even um, the two of us that have the sort of privilege and ability to be online right now and be in conversation yeah. when there are so many other folks um, who are um, 
uh, essential workers, right, and are doing things that are essential to taking care of us and taking care of society and making sure we have food and health care and all those things that far too often we haven't treated as essential. That's um, right. That's right. I'm, I'm interested just um, in terms of... Um, of how the content has landed sort of in this moment as a lot of people are home and binging. I mean, a lot of people don't have access to be home and binge. Um, yeah. What are some of the things you've been hearing um, from folks in terms of how they may even been, you know, connecting this to some of the, some of the ways in which they are experiencing uh, this world? And, what, and are, are there any things that you've thought about since, the, since it's landed and as you're now experiencing a very different world from when you were producing it? Yeah, I, you know, I think one of our, one of the things that, that was really exciting for us about the material, but also scary, was that the show brings up so much. There's so much to talk about, whether it is immigration, adoption, race, class, gender norms, um, LGBTQ issues, parenting, you know, there's just so much going on in the show. And for me, doing a show with that level of content complexity is so exciting. But you also hope that people are going to take the time to talk about it and process it. That when things get triggered, that they have the room to be unpacking it, you know, on their own and with loved ones. And so, strangely, this pandemic has really created an environment where we're putting these issues out there and we know that people are dealing with them because people have, not everyone, but a lot of people are having the space and the time to really unpack what we're bringing to them. Um, and so the conversations on social media and in person and over the phone and however, like the level of conversation about the content is so nuanced and, and really thorough. So that's been really exciting. Reese and I have talked a lot about how you know, people are talking about the, the issues across the board with this show, and it's really allowing for deeper vulnerability, which is kind of what we went through making the show, to be honest with you, because Reese had to be willing to talk about where she comes from and what her beliefs were growing up and what her parents' were beliefs were, and all of the writers were doing that, and I was doing that. Like, we were all really bringing our kind of naked selves and, and what we thought about in the 90s and what we're thinking about now. Like, we brought all that to the mix so that we could make this soup together. Um, and so now that now seeing other people take the content and be willing to do that themselves, to be willing to share of themselves vulnerably online and with each other, that's been just extraordinary. Such a gift. Very, very fulfilling. So, you know, I love how you talked about there was so much in the book and there was so much in the content. And then you all decided to add more. I right? know. <laughs> <laughs> you all decided to add more because Mia wasn't actually black, right? Yeah. In the book. Um, That's right. Yeah. I mean, Celeste, it's interesting. Celeste Ng, who's the brilliant writer who wrote yeah. the novel, yeah. she has said that in her heart, Mia was always a woman of color. Um, and, and that she thought, she, she imagined Mia as being other from Elena and even from Bibi, because she shares ethnicity with Bibi as an Asian woman. Um, but she, she, to her, to her um, current, I mean, really, what, what am I trying to say? Like, what she did that I thought was extraordinary was she didn't try to write in the voice of a black woman because she felt like she couldn't. Um, and so she kind of wrote Mia as this sort of general other. And we know that she's other based on class and other in other ways. Um, but she didn't try to have a black woman's voice when she didn't feel like she could. Um, but when it was really Reese's idea, Reese and her producing partner, Lauren Neustadter, they had the idea to ask me to play Mia and to invite me in as an actor and a producer um, and yeah it just added to to the complexity because I think a lot of what the novel is about is it's about how you navigate difference right very different kinds of mothers who come from different parenting ideologies different classes different traditions different kinds of employment you know they were just they're so different and so we added in the explicit difference of race as well and I think it just it added to to the juiciness of the show. You know, it's like, it was an a interview that I read from the author um, that sort of struck me because it was so um, interesting about that piece of not wanting to write 
uh, for a black character and not really being able to dig there. But also speaking to this idea that as a person of color, she knew white people. Like she, because yeah. as a person of color to navigate the world, you yeah. have to know white people. It's interesting because we do a lot of work around race in the writer's room at Color of Change mm -hmm. through our program and trying to both tell the story of the lack of diversity, but also support uh, creatives, um, particularly black creatives, and getting into writer's rooms and challenging sort of the systemic um, exclusion. And so I was just really interested that she felt really comfortable writing for white characters because we have to know. Well, we, you have to, yeah. right? Like you, we know the oppressor. That's what double consciousness is, is that we, we don't get away with having one consciousness. You have to navigate the colonists. You have to navigate the oppressor. So as a woman of color, she knew she could write whiteness because we don't get to survive in hegemonic culture if we can't. But, right. but knowing that there was this other pocket of otherness that she had enough deference and respect for to say like, I, I, wanna, I wanna dance near it and honor that there is other otherness, but I don't wanna act as if it's a voice I can authentically write. I just, I think that's a really beautiful, I think it's something beautiful about Celeste and, and exciting that Reese and Lauren in reading the book could, could intuitively know that they had to dig deeper in, in their ideas about who Mia should be. Yeah, in the writer's room, in the kind mm -hmm. of like development, right? You couldn't just, I mean, you know, I've been in enough writer's rooms where people are reading and looking at other things besides the actual source material. People have to gain material to help, yes. think, especially in a, if a book is turning into a, a series, right? So what are the things that people were looking at, reading? What was helping to shape the sort of share experience yeah. of writers? So our writer's room was led by Liz Tigelar, who is, she's so brilliant and so generous. She's a, a truly generous leader. And she had an eye toward diversity in the writer's room in every possible way. So meaning she had all different kinds of parents, fathers, mothers, mothers who came through being a mother biologically, via a surrogate, via adoption. Um, she had folks from Ohio, folks from urban centers. She had an eye toward um, having LGBTQ representation in the room and not in the room, black women in the room, um, Asian folks in the room. Like she really felt like she wanted to have eyeballs and, um, and consciousness that could reflect all of these areas that we were going to dig in. And, and also not just one black writer in the room, right? Like we had many different kinds of black women in the room who could um, bring lots of different kinds of experience of blackness to play. Yeah. So, you know, as I, as I was watching and another thing I was struck by was the, both the sort of how the characters of the kids developed, right? Mm -hmm. We oftentimes don't, always see the sort of relationship from between kids and parents in sort of a full spectrum where the kids are their own people and the parents are their own people. And yeah. you're seeing kids from a strength-based perspective, right? You're seeing them from their full selves. And, and, and I felt like each of the kids had their sort of own very clear arc, right? Their mm -hmm. own pictures. Their, yeah. own, um, their own ideas about the world and how the world should be, even as they were sort of developing, and I'm interested in sort of how the adults sort of help to, in the writer's room, help to sort yeah. of bring together this very diverse group of uh, characters. Yeah, I mean, even that, I mean, you know, some of the writers themselves had been adopted. Some of them grew up in Ohio. Some of them, um, I think one of the things we learned is that this happened, we were in a pre-production meeting. I think we were meeting with different directors and Reese and I were looking at costume boards. We were looking at pictures for wardrobe for the teenagers. And I was like, oh, I had that jacket. And she was like, I had those shoes. And all of a sudden we were like, oh, we're playing our mothers because <laughs> we were kids in the 90s. So I think there was, for a lot of the writers, there was a real sensitivity toward these teenagers because it was our music, it was our clothes, it was our world. So writing those teenagers was, was really writing ourselves 20, 30 years ago. Um, and, and, and I think there was some real, um, a different kind of love and respect for those characters because of that, because we knew we were writing us. Um, or we were playing, casting us, and that we were playing our mothers. So there was a lot of um, interesting 
compassion and empathy across generations because we were we were we really were dancing in each other's shoes. Yeah, I graduated from high school in '97, and so I yeah. was I was taken right back to yep. like some of these moments, like the music and the scenes. Yeah. Like, I mean, part of it PTSD, part of it nostalgia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So all those things are like are real. You know. Um, you, you have been very visible in your activism outside of your, um, your sort of, your, your creativity, your creative work, and, and you've worked to like combine those things. I'm interested yeah. that as you, um, as you took this on and as you were thinking about the layering of storytelling, how are you thinking about how it was connecting to the work you've been, you've been doing out in the world and, and the, the, the kind of issues and themes you've been trying to give voice to, get people to care about, make people stand up for? Yeah, yeah you know, um, it's interesting. I, I think as artists, many of us tend to be drawn towards civic engagement because our job is to think about humanity. Right, like our job is to think about what it means to walk in somebody else's shoes and and see the world through somebody else's point of view. So that lends itself to a kind of a practice of compassionate curiosity, um, and you become invested in the idea that all human beings deserve safety and dignity, basic human rights. Um, so I. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a bit of a dance for me and every project is different. You know, we have some projects at Simpson Street that are, that are more explicitly political. Um, like we just did a documentary on the ACLU that's, that was at Sundance and, um, and that will come out this summer. And that is obviously a piece about people who are at the front lines of fighting for civil liberties for all Americans. So that that is obviously a film that, that has deep, deep political ideology. Um, a show like this, for me, the politics are in the humanity. So I guess it's funny, I've never had the privilege of being apolitical in my work as an actor because, you know, when you, as, as a person who comes from a disenfranchised community, when you bring three-dimensionality to your character and you demand that your audience see you as fully human, that's a political act. So when I did Save the Last Dance and I was playing a, a teen mom in inner city Chicago, I knew that my job was to make audiences fall in love with Chenille, to love Chenille, to want to be Chenille. And I knew that that was a political act because it was at a time in this country where we were trying to do abstinence only education, where we were cutting funding for teen moms, where we were um, trying to cut social services that, that a character like Chenille would rely on to raise her child. So by me making you see Chenille and love Chenille, you were forced to think of, of an American that you, not you, but, but audiences would be forced to see us, right? To really see us and to love us. So anytime that I put myself at the center of a story and demand that audiences see me and hear me and value my experience, whether you love me or hate me, but value my humanity as a black person, as a woman, it's a political act. No, that's, that is like, that's so clear. And I think that in many ways, as we think about our work at Tell Black Stories, right, it is about having specific, authentic portrayals, right? And even though Mia's character wasn't actually sort of written directly as a Black woman, right, when you all translated her to screen as a Black woman, you just didn't like make her make her Black without any backstory or any connection. No, listen, there was, in the first edit of the pilot, um, I wasn't happy with the first edit. And, and it was interesting because in order for me to communicate to my fellow producers and to our editors what was missing, it was vital for me to have black allies on the producing team because we had to basically figure out how to say like, there's not enough side eye. And like, yeah. how do you communicate that to an editor, right? Like, like, I know you want people to like Mia, but I'm telling you that as a black woman, when she says my mother segregated this school and she just says that out her face, we're like, 
randomly, yeah. I'm going to have side eye about that. Yeah. And, and you might think that it's hostile, um, other producers, editors, like, but I'm telling you, like, if, if we don't give our black audience that, they're not going to understand what Mia's thinking. Like, you, you, you got you to gotta know not just what Mia would say, but how Mia listens, um, what she hears and how she hears mm -hmm. it. And I had fellow black women on the producing team in the writer's room that I could say, like, watch this with me. How do we convey, like, what are we missing? How do we communicate that? Because the Mia I did in the room is not quite in the edit. And how do we get her there? I know. I love that because, you know, part of also what we learned in focus groups that we were doing was like, you and you mentioned it, like having one black writer is not enough, right? Having no. it's like having it's like having one black person or one woman in a board of directors. Like you're the token, and you can't carry all that weight. It's too much. Like it was so. It's funny when I saw, and I'm and I. I mean, Reese Witherspoon, Lauren Neustadter, Liz Tegeler. These are like incredibly woke white women who want nothing more than for my performance to be real and authentic. Yeah. They. I, but you can, they can't they st they still don't live my life and walk in my shoes right so so for me to be able to feel empowered even as Kerry Washington like i watched the pilot and as Kerry Washington i was like i don't know what to do like <laughs> my performance that i did it's like somebody cut around it like what's happening here and it, it just took a conversation it just took a learning it just took some sharing between us to get to the same page and be like oh got it now we understand what's missing and what to do differently but it was so much easier for me to make that happen with another person in the room because i'll tell you it it was um it was hard for me like when i when i saw that first edit i was like it made my heart hurt because i realized that i realized that the mia i had created wasn't actually being seen by some of our collaborators and um, and the work to make that translation happen it's an emotional ride to say to people that you're working with and that you love like I need you to see me differently I need you to acknowledge the work but acknowledge the character and her journey her arc differently like that takes a lot of vulnerability um, yeah. As, I, as I have seen people that I love and respect um, on social media, like in love with this series, the way that I am and like being like, oh yeah, there, I think that that what you're describing actually is the gap, right? Is that that, that space, that space between sometimes content that could have hit the mark. Yes. We recognize that it was, um, it was maybe about us, but not for us. That's or not right. And not by us. Not by mm -hmm. us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so what, I think what you're also describing, right, is all of the ways in which um, there has to be sort of a 360 engagement or else we don't mm -hmm. have it. We actually don't get to um, something that people can fully experience. That's right. That's yeah. right. And what was tricky and so exciting about this project was Reese's people, her demographic, her audience, they needed to see and understand and buy into her as much as my folks, all our gladiators and other audiences needed to see and buy into Mia. And so we were doing a dance where Elena, where you could believe Elena and you could believe Mia and our audiences could buy in and feel like they were seeing themselves in this joint story. And it was a really, really special dance. I'm, I'm so, I mean, Reese and I are friends for life. I'm deeply, deeply grateful to her as a partner because we, um, we really fought for each other and for ourselves, for the for both of those women, for there to be room for both of, of those women to be fully realized and not have this be like a white woman's story or a black woman's story, but like how do we, even down to the music, like how do we make this a story where everybody has a seat at the table and belongs and feels seen and heard and valued and loved and, and human? Yeah. I mean, as we think about, right, the stories that we tell, the, the American story, the, the fuller story of our connectedness and, to be clear, our disconnectedness. That's right. That's there right. Is so much, um, there is so much richness, richness in this content, and there's so much richness in what we're experiencing as we head in this moment and we think about the sort of 
ways in which we're experiencing our families, the ways in which we're thinking about the election, the ways in which we have mm. to engage around so much in the world. And so as we sort of wrap up um, this discussion, which feels like it just, we just started. I know, I'm like, what do you mean wrap up? What, I wanna hang out with you all day. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm like, I'm like, but we hopefully, we hopefully will do this again soon. But I first wanna thank you because when you first told me about the project at Sundance and, um, and you were like, you have to see it. Um, I was instantly like, like sure, sure. Um, but I, 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 I like sure. I did, yeah. But I said sure. But I initially saw, I think maybe a trailer on the side, and I didn't know all the elements. And when I yeah. first saw that that first, um, when I saw first saw the first episode, I was like hooked and spent um, like a little bit too much time um, <laughs> one night digging into multiple episodes, and um, um, my staff had to deal with me the next day. But as we think about it, you know, a lot of our work at Color of Change is rooted, especially a lot of our civic engagement work, is rooted in this idea of Black joy, which for us is not the absence of pain, but the presence of aspiration. Not just what we are fighting against, but what we are fighting for. And um, content, mm. togetherness, all in, a, and in the midst of so much pain. I love the fact that Black people have been at the center, whether of giving so much joy, whether it's content that's making us binge, whether it's the IG lives that we can't get onto sometimes because um, they're overflowed and we're watching musical battles, whether there are so many different things. I'm interested in what's giving you joy right now and what do you hope um, we can give us collective joy as we sort of move forward with this really troubling time that we're all in? Such a great question to end on. Um, you know, like I said before, I feel like this crisis is really shedding a light on, on the places that, that need us to show up more and better. And um, I'm really grateful that, that I'm being called on in my family, right? Like that as a mom, um, that with the help of a lot of online teaching, but that I'm, I'm homeschooling these kids of mine. And... Um, creating some structure and safety and room for them to have joy. And that is bringing me a lot of joy. Um, being required to spend more time and be more present with them is, you know, the privilege of a lifetime, quite honestly. Um, and, and to do it with a real sense of, um, like that all we have is today you know, that we really, what we have is today. So making time for, for these kind of conversations and continuing the work, because I want to continue to keep my, my company afloat because I have people who work for me who I want to work for them right now so that they can yeah. keep working with me and for me, but also to be really present for my family in, in, in deeper ways. And um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. I've also been, I highly recommend this if people have the time because we're all home in the evening. Um, I've been interviewing my parents and recording it. Um, and wow. it feels like, you know, there's never enough time to, to talk to our parents, but like to really be able to ask them questions and have them ask me questions and learn things about them and, and just have it, you know, for my great grandkids. I feel like there's, there's been stuff written about me, but, but to get their lives recorded um, for my kids and grandkids and great grandkids, it, it's just, it's, it feels really special. That's beautiful. I hope, I hope folks who will take that up. I know that um, I am. Um, yeah. and, and so is, before we close, anything else people should be looking for from you? Is there anything else people should be keeping their eye out? Uh, yeah. from Simpson Street beside they were the, I know the ACLU documentary is coming but yes yeah, so that's called The Fight so please right. look out for that we're really proud of that really excited um, I'm almost done filming a movie called The Prom uh, with, with Ryan Murphy we have three days left on shooting <laughs> so we got shut down in, in this stay at home time which is super important but uh, so that'll be coming out and we're just yeah we're just you know working away. Yeah, we have lots of exciting. I have a film in development with Sterling K. Brown that we're hoping to get off the ground. So um, it's at Lionsgate, but we're just, we're hoping we get to film it sometime soon because it's, it is just really fun and I love him. So 
Yeah. We're going to be looking out for all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rashad. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for all that Color of Change does to impact culture and to just be there for Black folks and to love us and to, to honor us and to fight for us. You know I'm a huge fan of yours. So thank you for having me. That, that really means so much. And for folks, visit us at changehollywood.org. If you're at home, if you're watching this on your phone and you want to engage in the effort to stand up around um, the fight to protect Black communities as we respond to this crisis, visit us at theblackresponse.org. Theblackresponse.org is where there's a wide range of campaigns, federal, local, and, um, and community-based. They're all about helping Black communities thrive in this moment and fighting for the type of protections that we deserve. So theblackresponse.org. And then, of course, you can always text storytellers to 225568 to learn more about our Hollywood work. Carrie, you are the best. Thank you so you much. You are. Thank us. you. And thank you all for joining us. And we will see you next time. Mwah.